the Teach for America teachers are, have been largely placed in the schools where we have high percentages of low income and black and Latino kids. Those are the children who really need the stability of a strong school community with teachers who have had the best training, not the opposite. Welcome to the 10th episode of Truth for America. Uh, my name is Julian Vasquez Heilig. I'm a professor of educational leadership and policy studies at California State University, Sacramento. I also serve as the education chair for the California NAACP. I'm also excited to be here with my co host, Jameson Brewer. Hi, I'm Jameson Brewer. I'm a visiting assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a fellow at the Forum on the Future of Public Education. Today we're excited to talk with uh, Lita Blanc from uh, San Francisco, who uh, was recently involved with the decision of the district to pull back from Teach for America for the coming year. Uh, so we're really excited to have her uh, on the program, and, and she'll introduce herself. This is Lita Blanc. I'm president of the United Educators of San Francisco. Uh, we are a union of 6,200 educators, teachers, paraprofessionals, security guards. Uh, we have almost everyone in our union except for the secretaries and janitors at our schools. Great. Thank you so much. And. I'm just so happy to have you uh, on the on the podcast today. You, so often we talk about teachers' unions, and and what we're really talking about are educators, our educators working together uh, for reform on behalf of students and schools. So so happy to have you today. So uh, in the news, uh, we learned that the San Francisco uh, Unified School District Board of Education pulled support for Teach for America for the 16-17 school year. So while, while you know, this, this is a really big sea change, perhaps, we know that, for example, funding has been pulled back in, in Nevada in the past, in Minnesota, in other places. And I often get questions um, on email, even one this week, which is, how is it that we have this conversation about going a different direction, moving away from TFA. Could you tell us a little bit about the background of, of this decision? So TFA's been in San Francisco, I'm not exactly sure for how many years, I would say about 10 at least. And last year was the first time I was aware that there was a possibility that there was strong sentiment on the school board for actually even for eliminating the program. Around this time last year, it was probably mid-May, a school board member um, actually brought a resolution to eliminate the program, and we caught the union caught uh, wind of that at the last minute. And anyway, so there was a modest mobilization at the school board to speak from from union members to speak about the uh, the downside to, of te- Teach for America. And so a year ago, the school board basically there was a compromise. Rather, uh, well, I should back up a little bit. There were some people on the school board who wanted to, uh, and the superintendent were hoping to uh, expand the number of um, teachers coming in through Teach for America. It had been, I believe, 16, and they wanted to fund up to 24 positions. And there was uh, at least one, a couple of school board members who wanted to um, eliminate the program altogether. And what happened at, at that school board meeting was basically a compromise. There were not the votes to eliminate it at the time, but um, it was maintained. That was the compromise. It was like status quo. So this year there were 16 Teach for America first-year teachers in the district. So that's the background. So this is the same school board, same composition the school boards we had last year. And I think what's really made the difference between last year and this year, knowing that the school boards basically made up of the same um, elected uh, members, is that San Francisco is facing an acute teacher shortage. 
last summer um, the district had to hire 400 new teachers at the beginning of the school year and it looks like now they're saying that they're going to be looking for 500 teachers like there's this terrible turnover so the question of uh, stability in our classrooms is really key and I think that the, the climate has changed as far as looking at Teach for America as a viable solution for the our schools. What's interesting is uh, in episode four, we had a couple of Bay Area TFA teachers on, and what they told us was that their starting salary living in the Bay Area was $33,000. Now, having gone to graduate school in the Bay Area, um, living on $33,000 is, is difficult enough in a 12-month period. But then add to the fact that Teach for America required them to commit about half of their salary to a university for special education uh, master's degree. So essentially these students were, these four, uh, you know, these young, bright, uh, idealistic kids were living on $14,000 in the Bay Area for a year. So one of the things that TFA brought up is that the ter- teacher turnover in, in the Bay is, is quite high. Why, why do you think that is? Do you think that the fact that educators are not compensated in a way that allows them to live lives of professionals in that area is part of the conversation? What, what do you think the other reasons are that, that there's such a large teacher shortage and is bringing in a program that has a large amount of turnover uh, you know, year to year? Is that, is that the solution? So the bigger question about why the high rate of teacher turnover, um, the gen- I mean, there's the, here in San Francisco, which has been identified as the most expensive city in the world, in the world, sorry, it feels like the world, the most expensive city in the United States, surely teachers are not being paid a competitive salary. There is, the, the Chronicle did a wonderful spread about two weeks ago, um, which your listeners can, can check online where you can compare San Francisco teacher salaries to those in the you know, comparable um, cities around um, California, as well as what the average educator is paying for uh, rent, you know, in their in the city where they live. So high, high cost of living, uh, the district not prioritizing um, paying a living wage the way it could and should be. So that's, that's true across the board, whether we're talking about Teach for America trained teachers or not. But the... We, we know all too well that Teach for America teachers, and I, I want to say one thing, which is that I, as a person, but also as union president, I know many wonderful teachers who did go through Teach for America, and they are still in the district. So um, we are not, um, our argument is not with those dedicated individuals who have, have stuck with teaching right. and came into the program. It's with the larger the larger picture, how Teach for America fits into privatization yes. of public education. In any case, so in our in, in San Francisco as elsewhere, the fact that generally very young, idealistic individuals are thrown into a classroom after five or six weeks of boot camp and expected to deal with the challenges of teaching in a very, you know, that we now... We, expectations grow every year as to what teachers are supposed to do. It's, it's not a foundation for success. Right. So, it, so I, I have a question. It, it seems to me that, you know, the Teach for America, of course, our listeners know, you know, since they began 25 years ago, their intention or their stated intention was to attend to a, well, what was then a national teacher shortage, right? And, and so sort of the, the big teacher shortage in San Francisco sort of plays into Teach for America's narrative, right, that there's this big shortage in that, yes, core members only get five weeks of training, but they uh, should be uh, better or uh, the districts would rather have them than have long-term subs. It seems to me that the uh, district's decision to uh, put a pause on the contract suggests that they're interested in attending to some of the reasons uh, for the shortage rather than looking for band-aid approaches. Is that your sense of, of why the district has now chosen to stop their contract with TFA? I think that's I think that's true to a, a certain extent. I certainly hope that's true because uh, 
we are actually at a crossroads in San Francisco because of because of the acute teacher shortage and the affordability crisis, which is not going away because real estate uh, developers are continuing to set the framework for what it costs to live here in San Francisco. Um, so I think what's happened is that um, the the school board is hope, has been asking themselves these same questions for several years in a row. What can we do to uh, attract uh, talented teachers? What can we do to keep talented teachers? And they have, and they, and they, I believe that they're starting to understand that a program like Teach for America institutionalizes um, turnover, because, and then, and, and another, another factor is that in San Francisco, uh, we have. Um, a stellar alternative to Teach for America, which has gotten national press, the San Francisco Teacher Residency Program. The San Francisco Teacher Residency Program has a retention rate after five years of 80%, which has held, which has held 80% um, compared to Teach for America, which I, here in the city overall has had about a 30% retention rate, but I believe the last year's data was like under 20. Um, so that the Teacher Residency Program is provides so much more than Teach for America even, ever even a pretend, so anyway. The, the, the residency program, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the general outline, but it, it provides for a year's um, support uh, with a, uh, a cooperating teacher and the, as basically in a student teacher uh, role, but then the support for the new teacher continues in year two and year three with ongoing coaching, which is beyond what, uh, under the best circumstances, the district provides for a first-year teacher through the BITSA program. Um, and there's a number of other, like, material supports that uh, allow these teachers to, f to feel respected and supported by, by the district as they move through their stages to become a fully credentialed teacher. So that's the San Francisco Teacher Residency Program, and UASF has been saying for several years, we have a program that works, uh, that's with the cooperation of Stanford and USF, why not try to duplicate or expand that program? And that actually, they, that message was heard and we're really pleased um, because the Teacher Residency Program this year is expanding up to 50 um, candidates this year, and we're, Hopefully, that there will even be some possibilities for expanding further in the future. So, that data I think was pretty convincing to the school board members that there's a better way to, to train new teachers. And that, you know, that's a really I'm so glad you mentioned this residency program. And I, you know, uh, I think Jameson nailed it right on the head, which is that in episode two, for example, when we debated uh, Education Post. Tracy D'Angelo uh, framed this as it's TFA or nothing, or TFA or subs. But the reality is, is that there are programs like the residency program in San Francisco that have a stellar reputation. In North Carolina, where they killed the North Carolina teaching fellows and instead gave the tens of millions of dollars to Teach for America, uh, these are examples of programs that have uh, long-standing, uh, high-quality reputations. Um, I talk with the uh, uh, director of, of credentialing here at uh, uh, the faculty member in charge of credentialing, the chair of the, the department here at uh, California State Sacramento. And I asked her, you know, San Francisco has more than 400 openings potentially this fall. And we were at graduation and I, was, I, was, I saw our incredible uh, teacher candidates cross the stage, very diverse, many, many Latinas. We graduated uh, this year. And I said to her, has San Francisco Unified contacted you only about 80, 85 miles down um, the highway? Have they contacted you about uh, bringing our teacher candidates into the district? And she told me, no, absolutely not. They haven't. Well, then I told her, well, you know, San Francisco Unified has hired TFA teachers at $33,000. Do you think our teacher candidates would go to San Francisco and work for $33,000? Uh, and she chuckled at that thought. Um, you had talked a little bit about uh, how Teacher America is a, a part of this broader uh, privatization, neoliberal approach to education. 
what other ideas have you seen uh, Teach for America and their allies bring uh, to San Francisco Unified? We know, for example, that they're right in the middle of the charter discussion in Oakland and in many other cities. Oakland, of course, has the highest concentration of charters of any uh, city in the state, even though L.A. has more charters. Uh, what other sort of ideas have you seen folks that are allied with Teach for America try to bring uh, to your district? So last fall, we were presented with the possibility of creating a, in, an in-house uh, teacher pipeline, uh, which in and of itself isn't, I think it's probably a decent idea, but it was, again, it was within the framework of a project that would be overseen by uh, the new teacher project. And it basically has all the elements of Teach for America, the six-week boot camp, um, and then thrown right into the classroom um, with minimal support. And also the the packaging of the proposal was very, very reminiscent of Teach for America's public relations pieces that I've seen. So appealing to people's sort of desire to do good. And and then there's an emphasis in in this particular particular model that's being explored Lord, actually, for implementation a year from now in San Francisco. Uh, emphasis on basically if you learn basic skills, like, you know, within the, that six-week boot camp, you learn basic skills, then if you master those skills, then you'll be okay in the classroom, as if teaching was, you know, learning to dribble a basketball or something like that. And uh, another an element in that uh, model, which I found very disturbing and, and we're continuing to watch um, from the union's point of view is creating benchmarks early on in the program by which you would then um, candidates would be eliminated from the program. So rather than a full, uh, a fully funded set of supports over several years to a person who's new to the profession, you have sort of the opposite. You give somebody six weeks worth of of training. And then you assess them, and then you say, "Oh, you're not. You don't make the cut." And then, and, and then the people who survive are put in the classroom. And it, to me, it just it furthers the deprofessionalization of teaching, which is the exact opposite. Um, but you know, I want to return to something which was sort of touched on really briefly at the beginning of this conversation, which was that Teach for America teachers are, have been largely placed in the schools where we have high percentages of low income and black and Latino kids, those are the children who really need the stability of a strong school community with teachers who have had the best training, not the opposite. So there are schools in San Francisco like Paul Revere that have been, um, have had many Teach for America teachers over the years, and the, the turnover there is tremendous. Um, this year alone at Paul Revere, they're losing 12 teachers, and that was the same situation a few years back. So the kids are they're not getting the quality that they deserve from their from their education. So essentially you you see it as perpetuating the 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 very issue that they um, argue that they're solving. Right. So I think it is important. I think I think we're making some ground in in the message that to do it the children who need the best teachers do not benefit from shortcuts and the district has to find the money to to attract and keep educators who've been properly trained. What would you say the elitist, most wealthy public school is in in San Francisco? What what would you say that school would be in the district? You know, I don't want to go there. I because I, I'll t- I'll tell you why. Because I'm not really about pitting one school versus another school. I don't even. I'm, I'll skip that question. Okay. Well, the reason why I ask that question is, do you see them assigning Teacher America teachers in the wealthy areas of the city? No, that that has that doesn't happen because um, for many reasons those schools do not face the same teacher turnover that um, in general schools um, with higher numbers of kids from poverty face. There was something else I wanted to mention when you were talking about um, okay. we were talking about alternatives to Teach for America. Okay, we just San Francisco has historically had a wonderful program um, which is called Power to, Power Professionals a Teacher. A program whereby the district supports our paraprofessionals who are currently working in the schools towards getting their credential. And over the years, it's, you know, like 10 years ago, it was better funded. 
and during the recession, the, the, the funds got cut. So we're, we're kind of moving back towards more robust funding for that program. And that's the, and the, are the power professionals who are in our classrooms um, often make the best teachers. Right. Um, and, we're, and it's usually just a question of time and resources because everyone's holding down um, two or three jobs. Right. To working in the classroom. So that we currently have um, several talented people working on that in the district to expand that program. Right. And I, I think that is a really positive step, too. So what you're saying is empowering folks from that community. So not bringing in outsiders, but folks that are invested in your community, that are already in your schools, finding ways to give them opportunities to become ready to uh, uh, take on a professional career teaching. Right. Exactly. Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, uh, I'm sort of curious, I know that there are other cities in the country that have put a hold on their contracts with Teach for America or have chosen not to enter into some of those contracts, and, and I've, I've had uh, individuals from those areas and communities reach out to me about, you know, how do we, uh, how do we fight against these contracts, uh, how do we uh, spread this message that, you know, Teach for America... Uh, you know, it, institutionally, it, it's very short-term teaching. Uh, they're connected to the privatization of, of education, the deprofessionalization of teaching. You know, have, have you received, or are there folks in the city, do you know of other cities who are now looking to or reaching out to folks in San Francisco to, to sort of get a sense of how they could duplicate uh, this process in their areas? I personally have not um, heard from people in other cities in the last few weeks about this. I mean, I know that the issue of Teach for America is present for a lot of, in a lot of the larger cities in the, in the United States and, you know, perhaps over the summer when people have more um, time to reflect on what they're doing outside the classroom or inside the classroom. Uh, in the upcoming school year, I'll be able to have some of those discussions. But I'm, I welcome people uh, contacting me if they're interested in having a dialogue. Fantastic. So one final question. Teachers associations, teachers unions have been um, a part of this, uh, you know, they've been under a sort of microscope from Teacher America, whether it's, you know, Michelle Ree or folks in New Orleans or folks in D.C. But we've also seen, for example, in, in, in Las Vegas, the, uh, the teachers union there endorsing one of the managing directors of TFA for school board, which I thought was quite unusual. But so what would your message be to teachers and teacher associations, teachers unions across the United States about uh, how they can become more active uh, in this conversation about Teach for America? I think the most important, one of the most important aspects of what my message would be that at the bottom line is defending quality public education uh, across the board and that by highlighting the destabilizing aspect of a program like Teach for America, uh, we're actually advocating for our kids. That's what we're about. We're about providing the best education for our students and making sure that the people who are teaching our kids are coming prepared and able to uh, be in it for the long haul. Thank you so much for for joining us on the Truth for America podcast. Uh, You had mentioned that no one had contacted you yet about what had happened in San Francisco, but I suspect that after this podcast, you might be hearing from a few folks. Thanks again, Lita Blanco, for for joining us. Thank you.